Well, welcome everyone. Glad to see you. This is gonna be another fun night. We got stories to tell and we got some camaraderie that's gonna take place. You know how it is. That's how we roll. So get yourself something to drink. Find yourself a place to get comfortable. I wanna tell you a story. I got some more of that. Max Brand writing, you know, it's book three, The Seventh Man. And we're gonna start with chapter four, King Hall. There is a very general and very erroneous impression that alcohol builds the mood of a man. As a matter of fact, it merely makes his temper of the moment fast. A man who takes his first drink with a smile ends in uproarious laughter, and he who frowns will often end up fighting. Vic Gregg did not frown as he drank, but the corners of his lips turned up a trifle in a smile of fixed and acid pleasantry. His glance went from face to face in the barroom, steadily, with a trifling pause at each pair of eyes. Beginning with himself, he hated mankind in general. The burn of the cheap whiskey within served to set the color of that hatred in a fixed dye. He did not lift his chaser, but his hand closed around it hard. If someone had given him an excuse for a fist fight or an outburst of cursing, it would have washed his mind as clean as a new slate. And five minutes later, he might have been with Betty Neal, riotlessly happy. Instead, everyone overflowed with good nature, gossip, questions about his work, and the danger in him crystallized. He registered cold reasons for his disgust. Beginning in the first person, he loathed himself as a thick-headed ass for talking to Betty as he had done. As well put a burr under one's saddle and then feel surprised because the horse bucks. He passed on to the others with equal precision. Captain Laura Mare was as dirty as a greaser, and just like a greaser, loose-lipped and unsheven. Chick Stewart was a born fool, and a fool by self-culture, as his never-changing grin amply proved. Now Lou Perkins sat in a corner on a shaky old apple barrel and brushed back his long mustaches to spit at the cuspidor and miss it. If this were Vic Gregg's saloon, he would teach that old loafer more accuracy or break his neck. How are you, Gregg? murmured someone behind him. He turned and he found Sheriff Pete Glass with his right hand already spread on the bar while he ordered a drink for two. That was one of the sheriff's idiosyncrasies. He, he never shook hands if he could avoid it. And Greg hated him senselessly, bitterly for it. No doubt everyone in the room noticed, but they would tell afterwards how the sheriff had avoided shaking hands with Vic Greg. Cheap play for notoriety, thought Greg. Glass was pushing the bottle towards him. Help yourself, said Greg. This one's on me, Vic. I most generally like to buy the first drink. Pete Glass turned his head slowly, for indeed all his motions were leisurely, and one could not help wondering at the stories of his exploits, the tales of his hair-trigger alertness. Perhaps these self-legendary deeds sent the thrill of uneasiness through Vic Gregg. Perhaps it was owing to the singular hazel eyes with little splotches of red in them, very mild eyes. But one could imagine anything about him. Otherwise, there was nothing exceptional in glass, for he stood well under middle height, kind of a starved figure, with a sinewy, crooked neck, as if bent on looking up to taller men. His hair was sandy, his face tawny brown, and his shirt kind of a gray-blue, and everyone knew his dusty roan horse by nature, by temperament, and by personal selection, he was suited to blend into a landscape of sage-dotted plains or sand. Tireless as a lobo on the trail, and swift as a bobcat in a fight, hunted men who had been known to ride in and give themselves up when they heard that Pete Glass was after them. Any way you want, partner, he was saying in his soft, rather husky voice. He poured his drink, barely enough to cover the bottom of his glass, for that was another one of Pete's ways. He could never afford to weaken his hand or deaden his eye with alcohol. 
and even now he stood sideways at the bar, facing Greg and also facing the others in the room. But the larger man was sudden scorn for his caution, brimmed his own glass, and poised it swiftly. Here's how, and down it went. Ordinarily, Red Eye heated his blood and made his brain dizzy. It loosened his tongue and numbed his lips, but today it left him cool, confident, and sharpened his vision until he felt that he could see straight through the minds of everyone in the room. Captain Lorimer, for instance, was telling a jocular story to Chick Stewart in the, in the hope that Chick would set them up for everyone. And old Lou Perkins was waiting for the treat. And perhaps the sheriff was wondering how he could handle Vic in case of need or how long it would take to run him down. Not long, decided Greg, breathing hard. No man in the world could put him on the run. Glass was treating in turn and... Again, the brimming drink went down Vic's throat and left his brain clear, wonderfully clear. He saw through Betty Neal now. She had purposely played off Blondie against him to make them both jealous. Won't you join us, Dad, the sheriff was saying to Lou Perkins, and Vic Gregg smiled. He understood. The sheriff wanted an excuse to order another round of drinks because he had it in mind to intoxicate Gregg. Perhaps Glass had something on him. Perhaps the manhunter thought that Vic had had a part in that Wilsonville affair two years back. That was it. And he wanted to make Vic talk when he was drunk. Well, don't mind if I do, Lou said, slapping both hands on the bar as if he owned it. And while he waited for his drink, well, what are they going to do with Swain? The daughter, an idiot. Swain was the last man Glass had taken and Lou Perkins should have known that the sheriff never talked about his work. The old ass was in his green age, second childhood. Swain's turn state's evidence, said Pete curtly. He'll go free, I suppose. Fill up your glass, partner. Can see you're thirsty yet. Now, this was to Greg, who had purposely poured out a drink of the sheriff's own chosen dimension to see if the latter would notice. This remark fixed his suspicions. It was certain that the manhunter was after him. But again, in scorn, he accepted the challenge and poured a stiff dram. That's right, nodded the sheriff. You got nothing on your shoulders. You can let yourself go, Vic. Sometimes I wish, he sighed. I wish I could do the same. That sneaky coyote, thought Greg. He's luring me on. Turn state's evidence, maundered Lou Perkins. Well, there's a lot of them lose their guts when they're caught. I remember way back in the time when Bannock was running full blast. Why did not someone shut off the old idiot before he was thoroughly started? He might keep on talking like the clank of a windmill in a steady breeze, endlessly. For Lou was old, 75, 80, 85. He himself probably did not know just how old. And he had lived through at least two generations of pioneers with the myriad stories about him. He could string out tales of the long trail, Abilene, Wichita, Ellsworth, Great Bend, Newton, where 11 men were murdered in one night. Now he knew the vigilante days in San Francisco, early times in Alder Gulch. Nobody would have thought Plummer was Yowler, but he turned out that way, droned on the narrator. Grit? Eh, he had enough to fit out 20 men. When Crawford shot him and busted his right arm, he went right on and learned to shoot with his left and started hunting Jack again. Packed that lead with him till he died. Then they found Jack's bullet in his wrist. It was all worked smooth by the play of the bones. Afterwards, it turned out that Plummer ran a whole gang. But before we learned that, We'd been fools enough to make him sheriff. We got the plumber right after he'd finished hanging a man and took him to his own gallows. You'd have thought a cool devil like that would have made a good den, but he didn't. He just got down on his knees and cried and asked God to help him. Then he begged us to give him time to pray, but one of the boys up and told him he could do his praying from the cross beam. That was Henry Plummer. That killed a hundred men, him and his gang. Hmm, murmured the sheriff and looked uneasily about. Now that his eyes were turned away, 
Vic could study him at leisure, and he wondered at the smallness of the man. Suppose one were able to lay hands on him, it would be easy to... See you later, boys, drawled Glass and sauntered from the room. Lou Perkins sighed as the most important part of his audience was disappearing, but having started talking, the impetus carried him along. He held Vic Gregg in his hazy eyes. But they didn't all finish like Plummer, not all the bad ones, no siree. They was Boone Helm. I've heard about him, growled Vic. But the old man had fixed his glance and his reminiscent smile upon the past, and his voice was soft with distance when he spoke again. Helm was sure enough bad one, son. They don't grow him like that no more. Wild Bill was a baby compared with Helm, and Slade wasn't a man at all, even leaving in the lies they tell about him. Why, son, Helm was just a lobo in the skin of a man. Like Barry, put in Lurimer, drifting closer down the bar. Well, who's he? Ain't you never heard of Whistlin' Dan? That one that killed Jim Silent? Busted up his gang. Why, they say he's got a wolf that can talk to it like it was a man. And old Lou chuckled. They say a lot of things, he nodded. But I'll tell a man that a wolf is a wolf, and they ain't nothing that can tame him. Don't you let him feed you the one of them lies like that, Lorimer. Now, but Helm was sure bad, see. He killed for the sake of killing. But he died game. When them boys run him down, he swore on the Bible that he'd never killed a man. And they made him swear it over again just to watch his nerve. But he never batted an eye. The picture of that wild time grew up for Vic Gregg and the thought of free men who laughed at the law. Strong men. Fierce men. What could one of these have done if that girl he intended to marry had treated him like a foil? Then they got him ready for the rope, went on Lou Perkins. Well, I've seen a tolerable lot of death, says Helm. I ain't afraid of it. There was about 6,000 folks had come in to see the end of Boone Helm. Somebody asked if he wanted anything. Whiskey, said Boone, and he got it. Then he shook his hand and held it up. He had a sore finger, and it bothered him a lot more than the thought of hanging. You gents get through with this or else tie up my finger, he kept saying. Well, Helm wasn't the whole show. There were was, there was some others being hung that day, and when one of them dropped off his box... Boone says, there goes one to hell. Pretty soon another went and hung there wiggling, and six times he went through all the motions of pulling his six-shooter and firing it. I counted. Kick away, old feller, says Boone Helm. I'll be with you soon. Then it came his turn, and he hollered, Hurrah for Jeff Davis, let her rip. And that was how Boone Helm... Now, the rest of the story was blotted from the mind of Vic Gregg by the thud of a heavy heel on the veranda. And then the broad shoulders of Blondie Hansen darkened the doorway. Now, Blondie Hansen dressed for the dance. And the knot of his black silk handkerchief turned up the front and above the gleam of his celluloid collar. It was dim in the saloon compared with the brightness of the outdoors. And perhaps Blondie did not see Vic. At any rate... He took his place at the other end of the bar. Three pictures tangled in the mind of Greg like three bodies in a whirlpool. Betty, Blondie, and Pete Glass. That strange clearness of perception increased and the whole affair lay plainly before him. Betty had sent Hanson, dressed manifestly for the festival, to gloat over Vic in Lorimer's place. He was at it already. All turned out for the dance, Blondie, eh? Taking a girl? Betty Neal, answered Blondie. The hell you are, inquired Lorimer, mildly astonished. I thought, why, why, Vic's back in town, don't you know that? He ain't got a mortgage on what she does. Then, guided by the side glance of Lorimer, Hanson saw Greg, and he stiffened. As for Vic, he perceived the last link in his chain of evidence. Hanson was going to dance, and yet he wore a gun. And there could only be one meaning in that. Betty had sent him down there to wind up the affair. Didn't you see, Vic? Blondie was saying. His flushed face seemed doubly red against the paleness of his hair. Have something? I ain't drinking, answered Greg. And slowly, to make sure that no one could miss his meaning, he poured out a glass of liquor and drank it with his face toward Hanson. Then he put his glass down. His mind was clearer than ever. 
And with an omniscient precision, with nerveless calm, he knew that he was going to kill Blondie Hansen. Knew exactly where the bullet would strike. It was something put behind him. His mind had already seen Hansen fall, and he smiled. Dead silence had fallen over the room, and in the silence, Greg heard a muffled ticking sound, the beating of his heart. Heard old Lou Perkins as the ladder softly, slowly glided back out of the straight line of danger. Heard the quick breathing of Captain Lorimer, who stood ghostly pale, gaping behind the bar. Heard the gritted teeth of Blondie Hansen, who would not take water. Vic, said Blondie, it looks like you mean trouble. Anyway, you just now done something that needs explaining. He stood straight as a soldier and rigid, but the fingers of his right hand twitched, twitched, twitched. The hand itself stole higher, very calmly. Vic hunted for his words, found them. A cattle rustler is bad, he pronounced. A hoss thief is worse. But you're the lowest sneak of the lot, Blondie. Again that silence with the pulse in it. And Vic Gray could feel the chill which numbed everyone except himself. The lower jaw of Captain Lurmer sagged. And his whisper came out in jerking syllables. God almighty. Then Blondie went for his gun. And Vic waited with his hand on the butt of his own, waited with a perfect, cold foreknowledge, heard Blondie moan as his colt hung in the holster, saw the flash of the barrel as it whipped out, and then jerked his own weapon and fired from the hip. Blondie staggered, but he kept himself from falling by gripping the edge of the bar with his left hand. The right, still holding the gun, raised and rubbed across his forehead. He looked like a sleeper awakening. Not a sound from anyone else. While Vic watched the tiny wraith of smoke jerk up from the muzzle of his revolver. Then Blondie's gun flashed down and clanked on the floor. A red spot grew on the breast of Hanson's shirt. And now he leaned as if to pick something up. But instead, he slid forward on his face. Vic stepped to him and stirred the body with his toe. It wobbled. Limp. Chapter 5. The Fight There were three spots of white in the dim saloon. The faces of Stuart, Lorimer, and old Lou Perkins. And at the feet of Vic grew a spot of red. Knowing with calm surety that no hand would lift against him even if he turned his back. He walked out the door without a word and swung into his saddle. And there for an instant, he calculated chances for the street stretched empty before and behind with not a sound of warning stirring in the Sloan. He was greatly tempted to ride to Doug Pim's for his blanket roll and a few other traveling necessities. But he remembered that the men of Alder rose to action with astonishing speed. Within five minutes, a group of hard riders would be clattering up his trail with Pete Glass at their head. An unlucky providence had sent Pete to Alder on this day of all days. There stood his redoubtable dusty roan at the hitching rack, her head low, one ear back, one ear flopped forward, her underlip pendulous. In a pasture full of horses, one might pick her last for, for either for stout heart or speed. Even in spite of her history, Vic would have engaged Gray Molly to beat the roan at equal lengths, but since he outbulked the sheriff full 40 pounds, he weighed in nice balance the necessity of shooting the roan before he left Alder. It was, he decided, unpleasant but vital, and his fingers had already slid around the butt of his gun when a horse whinnied far off, and the roan twitched up her head to listen. She was no longer a cloddish lump of horse flesh, but an individual, a soul. Greg's hand fell from his gun, cursing his sentimental weakness. He lifted Molly into a canter down the street. Still no signs of awakening behind them or about, only little Jack Sweeney playing tag with a black and tan puppy. The triumphant cackle of a hen somewhere off to the left, but as he neared the end of the street where the trail swung into the rocks of the slope, a door banged far off and a voice was screaming, Pete, Pete Glass. 
Gray Molly switched her tail nervously at the shout, but Vic was too wise to let her waste her strength hurrying up so sharp a declivity. That dusty roan whose life he had spared would be spending it prodigally to overtake him before long, and Molly's power must be husbanded. So he kept her at a quick walk by pressing the calf of one leg into her flank and turned in the saddle to watch the town sink behind him. Sometime in the vague, stupid past, Marnie had jog-trotted down this slope, but now he was a new man with an eye which saw all things and a gun which could not fail. Figures, singularly tiny and singularly distinct, swarmed into the street from nowhere. Men on horses, men swinging into saddles. Here and there the slant light of an afternoon twinkled on a gun barrel, and ludicrous thin voices came piping up the hill. As he reached the nether lip of Murphy's Pass, a small cavalcade detached itself from the main mass before Captain Larimer's saloon and swept down the street. First, a dusty figure on a dusty horse, hardly visible. Then a, a spot of red, which must be Harry Fisher on his blood bay, the long striding sorrel beside him that could carry no one except old Silver Waldron. Behind these rode one with the light glinting on his silver conchos, Matt Henshaw, the town Beau Brumel, then the black Gus Reeve, and last of all, Ronicky Joe on his pinto. Now, Ronicky Joe, a handyman at all things, and particularly guns, it showed how fast Pete Glass could work and how well he knew Alder. For Vic himself could not have selected five cooler fighters among the villagers or five finer mounts. The posse switched around the end of the street and darted up the hill like the curling lash of a whip. Good, said Vic Gregg. The damn fools will wind their horses before they hit the pass. He put Gray Molly into an easy trot, for the floor of the pass dipped up and down, littered with sharp-toothed rocks or treacherous rolling ones. As bad a place for speed as a stiff upslope. And according to his nicest calculation, the posse could not reach the edge of the gulch, for he was at the farther side, out of range of everything except a long chance shot. So he took note of things as he went, and observed a spot of pale silver skirting through the brush on the eastern ridge of the gorge. There would be moonlight that night, and another chance in favor of Pete Glass. He remembered then, with quiet content, that jogging in the holster was a power with which six words might stop those six pursuers. A long halloo came barking down the pass, now drawn out, now cut away to silence as the angling cliffs sent out the echo. And Vic loosened the rein. Gray Molly swung out with a snort of relief to a free-swinging gallop, and they swept down a great gentle slope where new grass padded the fall of her hooves. Yet even then he kept the mare checked and held her in touch with an easy play and wrist. He did not imagine that even the sheriff on the dusty roan would dream of trying to swallow up Gray Molly in a short sprint. But that assurance nearly cost Vic his life. The roar of hooves in the gulch belched out into the comparative silence of the open space beyond, and just as he gave the mare her head, a gun coughed, and an angry humming darted past his ear. Molly lengthened into full speed. He could not tell on account of the muffling grass whether the pursuit was gaining or losing. He trusted blindly to the mare, and when he looked back, they were already pulling their mounts down to a hand gallop. That would teach them to match Molly in a sprint, roan or no roan. He slapped her below the withers where the long, hard muscles rippled back and forth. She was full of running, her gallops as light as the toss of a bow in the wind, and now as he pulled her back to a swinging canter, her head went high and pricking ears. Suddenly his heart went out to her. She would run like that till she died. He knew. Good girl, he whispered huskily. The day was paling towards the end when he headed into the foothills of the White Mountains. He drew up Molly for a breath on a level shoulder. Already he was close to the snow line with ragged heads of white rearing above him. And far below, a pale streak of moonlight was the asper. Then out of that blacker night on the slopes beneath, he heard the clinking hooves of the posse. The quiet was so perfect, the air so clear, that he even caught the chorus of straining saddle leather, then voices of men. All the time, 
The effects of the whiskey had been wearing away by imperceptible degrees. And at that sound, all his old self rushed back on Vic Gregg. Why, they were his friends, his partners, these voices in the night, and that clear laughter floated up from Harry Fisher, who had been his bunkie at the Circle V Ranch years ago. He felt an insane impulse to lean over the edge of the cliff and shout a greeting. Chapter 6, The Rifle Dawn found him over the first crest. At noon, he was struggling up the slope of the second range, whose rise was not half so sharp as the upward plunge out of the asper. But in spite of that easier ground, Gray Molly would not gain. She went on with shorter steps now, and her head hung lower and lower. Yet when a down stretch opened before her, she went at it with a gallop as light almost as a race out of Murphy's Pass. Not once had she offered to stop. Not once had she winced from the labor of some sharp up pitch. But still, six horsemen hung behind her, and at their head rode a little dusty man on a little dusty roan. It was the lack of training as well as the rough going which held Molly back. Beyond that second range, however, the downslope stretched smoothly, evenly, for mile on mile and mile on mile. Perfect going for Gray Molly over easy hills with patches of forest here and there, where he might double, or where he might stop with the hunt sweeping past. All this the sheriff must have known perfectly well, for he no longer kept back with his pack of five but skirted on ahead, hunting alone. Again and again, Vic heard the little shrill whistle with which Pete Glass encouraged the roan. Vic used the spurs twice. Then he desisted from the useful brutality for Molly was doing her very best and no power on earth could make her do more. After all, her best would be good enough. For now, Vic looked up and his heart leaped into his throat for there was only one more rise above him. And beyond lay the easy ground and a running chance for Molly's slender legs. Even as he raised his head, something whined evilly over him, followed by a sound like two heavy hammers swung together face to face and shattered by the stroke. A rifle. He looked back, and he saw the roan standing broadsides toward him, watched the sun waver, and then flash in a straight, steady line along the barrel of the sheriff's gun. The line of light jerked up, and before the sound had reached him, a blow on his right shoulder sent Vic lurching forward against the pommel. Afterwards, the voice of the rifle rang around him, and a sharp pain twitched up and down his side, then ran tingling to his fingertips. It was the stunning blow which saved him, for the sheriff had the range, and his third bullet would have clipped Vic between the shoulders. But Glass had seen his quarry pitch forward in the saddle and he would not waste ammunition. The thrift of his New England ancestry spoke in Pete now and then, and he could only grit his teeth when he saw Vic disappearing on the other side of the crest, straightening the saddle. The next instant, the top of the hill shielded the fugitive. Well and nobly then, Gray Molly repaid all the praise, all the tenderness and care which Vic had lavished upon her in the past years. For with legs shaking from the struggle of that last climb, and with a rider who wobbled crazily in his seat, with reins hanging loose on her neck, not even a voice to guide or to encourage her, she swept straight across the falling ground, gaining strength and courage at every stride. By the time Vic had regained his self-control and rallied a little from that first terrible falling of the heart, the dusty roan was over the crest and streaking after the game. Gray Molly gained steadily, yet even when he gathered the reins in his left hand, Vic knew that the flight was done, in effect. How could he double or dodge when his own blood spotted the trail he kept, and, and how long could he keep the saddle with the agony which tore like saw teeth at his shoulder? Gray Molly plunged straight into the shadows of pine trees, and the cool gloom fell like a blessing upon Vic and his torment. It was heaven to be sheltered, even for a few minutes, from all the eyes of the posse. At the opposite edge of the woods, he drew rein with a groan, some devil had prompted Gus Reeve, and some devil had poured Reeve's horse full of strength. For yonder down the valley, not a hundred yards away, galloped a rider on a black horse. Yet Vic could have sworn that when he looked back from the crest, he'd seen Gus riding, the very last in the posse. An instant later, the illusion vanished, for the black horse of Gus was never an animal such as this, 
never had this marvelous long gait. Its feet flicked the earth and shot it along with the reaching stride so easily, so flowing, that only the fluttered mane and the tail stretching straight behind gave token of the speed. For the rest, it carried its head high with pricking ears, the sure sign of a horse running well within his strength. Yet Gray Molly, fresh and keen for racing, could hardly have kept pace with that black as it slid over the hills. God in heaven, if such a horse were his, a thousand sheriffs on a thousand dusty roans could never take him. Five minutes would sweep him out of sight and reach. And before the horseman ran a tall dog, wolfish in head and wolfish in the gate, which carried it like a cloud shadow over the ground. But it was over large for any wolf Vic had ever seen. It, it turned its head now and leaped aside at sight of the stranger. But the rider veered from his course and swept down on Vic. He came to a halt close up without either a draw at the reins or a spoken word, probably controlling his mount with pressure of his knees. And Greg found himself facing a delicately handsome fella. He was neither cowpuncher nor miner, Vic knew at a glance, for that face had never been haggard with labor. A tenderfoot, probably, in spite of his dress, and Vic felt that if his right arm were sound, he could take that horse at the point of his gun and leave that rider thanking God that his life had been spared. But his left hand was useless on the butt of a revolver, and three minutes away came the posse, racing. There was only time for one desperate appeal. Stranger, he burst out, I'm follered. I got to have your hoss. Take this one in exchange. It's the best I ever threw a leg over. Here's 200 bucks. He flung his wallet on the ground and swung himself out of the saddle. The wolfish dog, which had growled softly all this time and roughed up the hair of its neck, now slunk forward on its belly. Heel bark, commanded the stranger sharply. The dog whipped about and stood away, whining with eagerness. The moment that Greg's feet struck the ground, his legs buckled like a sapling in a wind, for the long ride had sapped his strength and the flow of blood told rapidly on him now. The hills and the trees whirled around him until a lean, strong hand caught him under either armpit. The stranger stood close. You could have my hoss if you could ride him, said he. His voice was singularly unhurried and gentle, but you'd drop out of the saddle in ten minutes. Who's after you? A voice shouted far off beyond the woods. Another voice answered nearer and the whole soul of Greg turned to the stallion. Greg Molly was blown. She stood now with hanging head and her flanks sunken alarmingly at every breath. But even fresh from the pasture, she was not a rag, not a straw compared to the black. For God's sake, groaned Vic, loan me your hoss. You couldn't stick the saddle. Come in here out of sight, I'm going to take them off your trail. Whilst he spoke, he led and he half carried Vic into a thicket of shrubs with a small open space at the center. The black and the wolf dog followed, and now the stranger pulled at the bridle rein. The stallion kneeled like a trained dog, and lying thus, the shrubbery was high enough to hide him. Closer, sweeping through the woods, Vic heard the crash of pursuit. Yet the other was maddeningly slow of speech. You stay here, partner. And sit over there. I'm borrowing your gun. A swift hand appropriated it from Vic's holster, and his own fingers were too paralyzed to resist. And don't you try to ride my hoss unless you want them teeth in your throat. Lie quiet and tie up your hurt. Bart, watch him. And there sat Greg, where he had slipped down in his days of weakness. The great dog crouched at his feet and snarling ominously every time he raised his hand. The voices came closer. The crashing burst on his very ears, and, and now, through the interstices of the shrubbery, he saw a stranger swinging into the saddle on Gray Molly and urge her to a gallop. He could follow for only a short instant with his eyes, but it seemed to Vic that Molly cantered under her new rider with strange ease and lightness. It was partly the rest, no doubt, and partly the smaller burden. A deep beat of racing hooves, and then the dusty roan shot out of the trees close by with the sheriff leaning forward, jockeying his horse. It seemed that no living thing could escape from that relentless rider. Then right behind Vic, a horse snorted and grunted as it leaped a fallen log, perhaps, and, 
as he watched in alarm to see if the stallion would answer that sound with a start or a whinny. The black lay perfectly still, and instead of lifting up to answer or to look, the head lowered with ears flat back until the long outstretched neck gave the animal a snaky appearance. The dog, too, though it showed murderous fangs whenever Vic moved, did not stir from his place, but lay flattening into the ground. Cut to the right, cut to the right, Harry, came the voice of the sheriff, already piping from the distance, as the last of the posse brushed out of the trees. Yo hoy, Gus, take the left arroyo. Two answering yells, and then the rush of hoofs fell away. They were cornering the stranger, no doubt, and Vic struggled to lift himself to his feet and watched until a faint sound from that dog made him look down. Bart lay with his haunches drawn up under him, his forepaws digging into the soft loam, his eyes demonic. Instinctively, Vic reached for his absent gun and then, despairingly, relaxed to his former position. The wolf dog lowered his head to his paws and there remained with the eyes following each intake of Greg breath. A rattle of gunshots flung back loosely from the hills, and among them Vic winced at the sound of the sheriff's rifle clear and ringing over the bark of the revolvers. Had they nailed the stranger? The firing recommenced, more faintly and prolonged so that it was plain. The posse maintained a running fusillade after the fugitive. After that fear of his own growing weakness shut out all else from the mind of Greg, as he felt his senses, his physical strength, flowing out like ebb tide to a sea which he knew was death. He began to work desperately to bind up the wound and stop the flow of blood, and it was fear which gave him momentary strength to tear away his shirt, and then with his teeth and his left hand rip it into strips. After that, heedless of the pain, he constructed a rude bandage, very clumsily, for he had to work over his shoulder. Here his teeth, once more, were almost as useful as another hand. And as that bandage grew tight, the deadly warm trickle along his side lessened, and his fingers fell away from the last knot as he fainted. Well, there you go. That's a heck of a running gunfight. Not something you want to be in the middle of, but good to listen to anyway. Let's do this again, folks. I know it's getting late. I know we're all tired. Gotta go back to school or go back to work or go back to whatever. So until I talk to you again, by golly, enjoy yourselves and be good to those around you and do the best we can. Oh, this is Clay Steele. Good night. <laughs>